The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I am your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V and pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. Hello, Tom. Nice to see you. You too. Thank you, Father. Tonight we will uh, continue to discuss some of our viewer topic uh, suggestions and questions that we receive via the email address. And one of our first questions, Father, comes from a viewer who would like to know if it's okay for Catholics to use affirmations. Okay, well, I, uh, I would have to research that a little bit further. Okay. But uh, I have a good authority that these affirmations uh, constitute a matter of uh, repeating, it, uh, kind of mantra-like to oneself, um, statements, positive statements about oneself. Uh, I've been told that People will say over and over again, I'm beautiful, I'm smart, right? Exactly. I'm courageous, I'm wonderful, etc., etc. They just keep saying that over and over again to convince themselves, evidently, of this. And uh, first of all, um, I guess there are a few things that come to mind right at the top of my head on this. One is, um, You know, this matter of self-esteem, I mean, people talk about self-esteem, and I wonder if this isn't kind of an outgrowth of the self-esteem idea, that uh, the problem that people have when they get into trouble, uh, whether moral trouble or legal trouble or whatever, is that they just have a lack of self-esteem. And if we could uh, build up their self-esteem, then they, they would overcome all of these problems that they have, and they would really be wonderful people, they'd never commit crimes, they'd never commit sins, because they have good self-esteem. And of course, uh, if the affirmations are related to building up self-esteem, then I, right there I would say there's something very, very wrong about it, because I, the self-esteem business is a, a real, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fraud, it is a fraud. Um, the the self-esteem idea is that we have to build up in the idea of the children, especially the idea that they are wonderful in the sense that, um, well, it comes out to they're entitled to everything. They're entitled to admiration. They're entitled to um, uh, whatever they want, basically. And um, if they don't get it, it's because uh, someone does not share and uh, does not afford them the, the esteem they need, they want, they deserve. And there's some, there's some kind of injustice committed against them if they don't get what they want and if people don't treat them the way they want. Um, people who have high self-esteem are you know, basically told you can get away with anything, do anything, you're entitled to everything. And um, they act as though uh, they are, you know, literally, quote, God's gift to the world. You know? <laughs> um, that is obviously not the problem. Uh, I'm sorry, that is not the answer to the problem. That is the problem. That is the problem. I mean, we have uh, such monsters of history as Hitler and, and Stalin and Mao and the rest of them. And uh, they had a very high self-esteem. But um, the one thing they did not really have is self-respect. And there's an enormous difference between self-esteem and self-respect, you know. Uh, does Satan have high self-esteem? Yes. Does he have self-respect? No. Uh, self-respect actually is a matter of humility. It acknowledges who one really is, it sees oneself in relation to God as our Creator, recognizes God's love for us, and that we have the ability to know and to love Him in return. And it actually, um, you know, affords to us our correct place in the world. Uh, that's what humility does. Um, Self-esteem basically, basically tells a person, you're just wonderful exactly the way you are, and everybody in the world owes you everything. Self-respect says, you have these talents and these powers that are God-given, 
and you are meant to use them and to achieve something with them and to earn something with them. And you don't earn self-esteem, but you do have to earn self-respect. You don't earn the you, you don't uh, earn so much the esteem of others, but you have to earn their respect by what you do. Uh, it's not just who you are being Mr. Wonderful. It is the fact that you have used the time, the talents, the energies that you have, that God has given you, to actually produce something of real value, you know, to use the life that God has given you to actually be productive and have something to show for the time and the effort that you have. So what they really, really need is self-respect, which goes together with humility. Self-esteem goes totally in the opposite direction. And so uh, when you have someone there uh, chanting mantra like, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, our Lord says, which of you can add to your statue one, one foot, one, one cubit, just by thinking about it? Um, you know, it, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, it could be self-delusion, complete self-delusion. Of course, the entire New, Ma New Age movement and the self-esteem uh, movement, if you want to call it that, is, it a, is an illusion. It's all based on a delusion anyway. But um, the, um, you know, uh, some, a wise man once pointed out in the old days Catholics had the uh, short prayers that they would are called ejaculations. They would say, my Jesus mercy, oh Lord have mercy on me, oh um, as we read in the Gospels, you know, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, you know. Uh, these are short prayers offered to God and uh, glorifying God and humbling ourselves before God. Now we want to replace them with, I'm beautiful, I'm grand, I'm wonderful. You might as well sit there and say, um, you know, I can play the piano when you don't know how to play the piano. I mean, you know, I can, I can jump, I can leap over tall buildings when you can't get out of the, get out of the chair. Uh, you can say that all you want, but again, it's self-delusion. So, uh, is it permissible for a Catholic to use such a thing? Well, I would say um, the need to um, to talk oneself into this by chanting this, to try to get something set in the mind about this, uh, already shows there's, I think, something of a pathological condition present there that someone would feel need for this thing. And I don't know that this is a uh, proper uh, and effective way of treating what's, you know, the problem that is there, to chant that. Um, rather, I think one has to go back to reality and, uh, and one has to uh, remember exactly what our faith teaches us. One has to go to the faith for the answer to these problems. Uh, no matter how lowly or no matter how uh, inconsequential the person may think he or she is, no matter how unattractive one th may think he or she is, um, what is really important is that they find their purpose in God and uh, they find their purpose in God's love in particular. And that is enough, it should be enough for anyone to realize I matter. My, my, my being, my existence matters because God created me to be me and no one else. He created me specially to be me, uniquely to be me, an act of the divine will to create me in his own, God's own image and likeness. And to realize what that is, the, the power to know what is true and to love what is good and to enjoy what is beautiful. Now, these are the things that make us human beings. You know? And in the image and likeness of God, we have to go back to the faith to inspire ourselves with these things. <coughs> you see, I guess really what I'm getting at is all these things on this, on that, on the other thing, these are all about the world and how I relate to the world and how other people perceive me, you know. I have to perceive myself as beautiful so others will perceive me as beautiful. I have to perceive myself as smart before others will perceive me as being smart. And, you know, this is not about how we appear in the eyes of God. This is about how we appear in the eyes of other people. And we're trying to kind of uh, ex use some therapy on ourselves <clears throat> to try to build ourselves up in our own minds. <clears throat> but it's all about how we, how we relate to the rest of the world. Um, but, and I, I think it's extremely unhealthy. 
So uh, I would discourage any Catholic from trying to use that to overcome a problem uh-huh. and a lack of self-respect. Uh-huh. You know, I, I would uh, talk to a person who felt a need to, to do that. I talked to a person in a, in a very encouraging way and hopefully a very realistic way with regard to our faith and try to impress upon them something much more important then I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful, I'm beautiful. <laughs> then they wake up the next morning and look in the mirror <laughs> and they realize it didn't help, mm-hmm. right? I'm smart, I'm smart, I'm smart. Then they keep making foolish mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is kind of, this is rather doomed to failure as all delusions are destined to give way to reality, you know? But there is one a truth that is not a delusion, and if they could just take that to heart and care about that, and that is God and His love, and He's created me for His love. Uh, these are the realities that really are the root of, of all human self-respect. Love your neighbor as yourself. Chanting these, these mantras about yourself, um, which may be entirely delusional, doesn't really enable you to love yourself for who you really are. Mm-hmm. It may enable you to have a false love for a, a false self, of someone you're really not. Mm-hmm. But uh, recognizing the reason why God created you and the fact that God loves you and the fact that God actually redeemed you at a great price to himself, the fact that he knew every single sin you would ever commit with every step he took on the way to Calvary, and it, it didn't stop him from going there. It, it, it moved him forward because he knew you needed him to make that sacrifice for you. The fact that you are worth that in the eyes of God, that is what really establishes the worth of man. And that is really the foundation of all human love and all human respect. Mm-hmm. And Father, it, it appears that these affirmations seem to be right in line with Satan's oldest mm-hmm. temptation of trying to convince mankind that they are God. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly an, 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 an anti-Catholic idea, yeah. and who can imagine any of the saints using yeah. the, the, these so-called affirmations? Well, tell you right, I mean, you have somebody who's saying, I'm beautiful, and this and that, I'm intelligent, I'm all-powerful, I'm all-powerful. I mean, how long do they keep, take to keep, where do they go with this? Mm-hmm. Before they start, uh, if they really get into it, and they really become fully delusional, you're right, would they stop short of going to that, to that extent to say, and basically, the, what the existentialists have been telling them all along in their college classes. You have your own reality. You create your own world around, world around yourself, mm-hmm. right? And uh, you are the god of your own world. And that's, that's where all of this is leading, I'm afraid. Right, right. I'd like to move on, though, Father. We have um, a couple different questions regarding popes of, of history. Mm-hmm. And one of our viewers here um, asked the question about Pi- Pope Pius XII, um, and asked why his, his local clergymen would follow some of the teachings of Pius XII. In particular, he says, our local priest, um, our local clergyman, insist on obeying the midnight Holy Communion fast. Um, and, and he points out, in his opinion, he says, Pope Pius XII was a terrible pontiff from the years 1951 to 1958. Um, he backs up that claim by saying he destroyed Holy Week and allowed the three-hour fast and his excuses about the modern world in evening Holy Mass were self-indulgent and lacked discipline and piety. How would you answer that? Well, this is this man's judgment, obviously, mm-hmm. right? Or this person's judgment. Right. And um, Pius the Twelfth. Uh, I mean, apart from what he was, what he was individually and personally. Okay, there are actually two separate questions here. Really, the uh, questions are whether these changes he made really contrary to Catholic tradition, you know, mm-hmm. that's what would concern us, not the worthiness of the individual, okay. although there's something to be said about that too. Okay. But, um, you know, with regard to the three-hour fast, Pope Pius XII did that, um, I understand basically it had a lot to do with the war. Okay. And uh, he wanted to make um, Holy Communion much more accessible. Uh, the question is, in my mind, and this has to do with Catholic tradition, is a three-hour fast really a fast or not? Right? Is it? <clears throat> I mean, the Novus Ordo chopped it down to an hour, and if you're taking care of someone who's sick, it could be down to 15 minutes. You know? <laughs> well, obviously, I mean, 15 minutes is no fast, right? right? 
And an hour, I mean, you, you drive to Mass by the time you find your place in the pew. Mm -hmm. By the time the sermon's over, I mean, you could have been eating a ham sandwich right up to the, through the offertory, right? With some <laughs> exaggerating, of course. But, so, I mean, there's, there's really no fast, you know. Um, does three hours constitute a fast? I, I mean, one could argue that from different points of view. One could say, well, um, can one become hungry in three hours? Uh, and I would say, well, yeah, there are people who certainly could become hungry in three hours. Um, would one have to observe the three-hour fast consciously and deliberately, or is it just something that would, one would do by accident? Well, I think uh, for a normal person, I imagine, they would have to be on guard against eating something for three hours. They'd have to have intentionally not eating anything for three hours. Um, uh, so, in, in that sense, that one could become hungry in three hours, after all, we put about three hours uh, between some meals, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and we have meals slated so many hours because you figure, well, by that time people would reasonably be hungry. A lot of it depends on the metabolism, and a lot of it depends on the work they do, I understand that, but nonetheless, somebody could become hungry, and the fact that they have to make a deliberate intention not to eat, over a three-hour period. I, I don't think that they could argue that three hours doesn't constitute any kind of fast, you know. I mean, you know, it could be a 40-day fast of our Lord in the desert, but that's obviously not what we're, you know, not what the Church has ever specified for us to receive Holy Communion. So, uh, I mean, I think that's an, a question that could be debated, honestly, you know. Okay. Uh, the 12-hour fast, or I should say this, <clears throat> the midnight fast obviously is what uh, the church imposed for a long, long time, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and it, had, and it had, had its power, certainly. It had its power behind it. In those days, you couldn't even take a, a sip of water. You couldn't even take a drop of water. It would break the fast. It was very strict. During wartime, that was very hard. You know, talk to the chaplains who would go down the front lines and offer multiple masses and go through the entire day and they would receive the precious blood from the chalice, and that's all, uh, in, terms, in terms of liquid, mm -hmm. or, or the, in, in any type of nourishment, in other words. So uh, it was very hard on them, but they were very strong and very tough, and they did that. They made the sacrifice. Um, uh, the Pius XII rules were to make receiving communion more accessible. Is that a bad idea in itself? I don't think so. I mean, Pope Pius, St. Pius X did that, right. right? Lowering the age of receiving Holy Communion, which, again, one could argue, well, you know, lowering it from the age of about 14 to about the age of 7 certainly decreases the ability of the child to grasp the significance of what he's doing insofar as he can and um, leaves it open to all kinds of childish, uh, you know, uh, uh, mayhem or whatever, yeah. but um, but he saw the value in that. You know? So I don't think one can dismiss that the reason just out of hand. Um, by the way, uh, what my understanding is that when Pope Pius the Twelfth did offer that uh, three-hour fast from solid foods and alcoholic beverages, one hour from liquids other than water. Uh, that he also said that one should uh, observe the midnight fast whenever possible. Okay. And he was saying that that is actually the, what is preferred, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my understanding, that he made that clear, that he, he did encourage the, uh, the fast from midnight. Okay. Uh, be kept where, mm -hmm. where possible and when possible. Okay. So, I mean, our writer is uh, basically... Uh, saying that that is preferable, but he's saying more than that. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, with regard to Pius the Twelfth, yes, there were things that came in uh, under his under his reign. I, I realize that, but uh, personally, I I think to some extent, and that perhaps as an explanation for everything that happened during his reign, that is not good. <laughs> but I think the modernists really took advantage of him. And uh, I think they were able to take advantage of him because of his illness. Okay. He, was a, he was not a well man. He was not a well man. Uh, one of the manifestations of his uh, frailty was uh, bouts of hiccups that would go on for days and days yeah. and days. 
And this is enough to wear anyone down. I mean, how do you, how does one even sleep in a case like that? And, uh, you know, when, when you're doing that, uh, that reflex is going on for hour after hour after hour. Well, we know from our own experience how aggravating that can be sure. and how debilitating that can be. And uh, this is just an outward manifestation of some, some issue. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I do believe that if you look at the reign of Pius XII, it is, it is an enigma where he, <clears throat> where he talks about uh, archaeologism, the tendency to want to go back to the earliest liturgy of the church and dig and dig until you find the earliest liturgy, the most primitive liturgy, like the modernists. The modernists were pushing this. And uh, Pope Pius XII condemned it. He condemned that whole idea. He said that is a false idea, it is not a Catholic idea, and uh, this is, we, we will have none of it. I mean, he just completely, uh, um, you know, repudiated the idea of archaeologism. And lo and behold, then, wait a few years, and what's coming out? Right? <clears throat> the revised Holy Week liturgy, and so on and so forth. Now, if you, if you read the things that he wrote in some places, and then you see the things that were done, you see there's a contradiction going on here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> was he just uh, confused, or was someone taking advantage of him? Uh, I'm personally, for what it's worth, convinced that the enemies of the church took advantage of him during that time, and uh, took advantage of his, his frailty, and took advantage of his illness, and it just kind of ran through what they wanted. Um, I just don't know what control he really had at that time. Did he sign documents? Allegedly, yes. Okay, but <clears throat> you see, uh, appearing at the time of Pope Pius the Twelfth, what later became very obvious during the time of John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, and so on, and that is contradictions. Mm -hmm. You know, glaring contradictions. Uh, things that didn't add up and even which pointed to a kind of deceitfulness and chicanery going on in the Vatican. I mean, there are examples that I could give you, but I won't get off into that right now. We already see the signs of that occurring during the latter half of the reign of Pope Pius XII. So, um, you know, the, this gentleman evidently has a very low opinion of him, and it's true, there were, many, there were things that happened during his reign that were, very, that were not good. Okay? Yeah very problematic, and uh, you might even say kind of set the stage for John the Twenty Third okay. in a certain way. Um, but I'm just not convinced that all of those were really attributed to, to Pope Pius XII, uh, how much of that was attributable to him, and how much of that was the work of enemies of the faith who had wormed their way in and had gotten into positions of power and used that power badly. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Interesting. So you would you would say he's not a terrible pontiff? Well, he was not there were many things he did that were very beautiful. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he wrote very often lovingly of our Blessed Lady, mm -hmm. and he promoted the Holy Rosary. Um, but again, I mean, one could argue the point. In Humani Generis, he, he was condemning the modernist ideas. Um, he talked about evolution. Evolution is kind of part and parcel, you know, with the modernism. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, be, and he said that you know we can't condemn the, just the very concept of evolution because God could do mm -hmm. what He did through using evolution. He could. He has the absolute power to do it. But he said in the encyclical Mani Generis that uh, any any idea of evolution has to conform itself to faith. Mm -hmm. It has to it has to conform itself to the truths of the Catholic faith. And he listed those truths about. Right. God, Creator, us created, souls, intelligence, will, you know, moral responsibility. He said, clearly, that's the first step. We have to look at any idea of evolution has to conform to the truths of our faith. If it doesn't, it's, 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 it's bad. Then he said, even a theory of evolution or explanation of evolutionary process that would conform to the truths of faith. He said, then it has to stand the tests of real science. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't stand the test of real science, then, of course, obviously, at that point, you know, no one should accept it. Sure. So uh, some would say, okay, he left the door open to evolution. He didn't leave the door open to, open to evolutionism because he says the faith has to, has to dictate, has to determine for us uh, truth and error. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that is our standard above all. Okay. 
So he didn't uh, really, honestly, leave the door open to evolutionism as some kind of religion unto itself. But some would argue that he left the door open to the theory of evolution. You know? um, and um, I mean, even the Big Bang. I mean, Pope, uh, Pius the Twelfth was involved in that in a, in a kind of curious way. Uh, as our read listeners know, the Big Bang theory began as a, a, a thesis of a, of a Catholic priest, right, right? Uh, Monsieur Georges Lemaitre. Georges Lemaitre uh, produced a work called *L'Atome Primitif*, the the primitive atom. It was back in the 1930s. In fact, I have the first edition in French of this word. It's interesting. Um, this became uh, a theory that was widely ridiculed in the scientific community of the time. Now, this is a man who would share the podium with Albert Einstein and other leading, you know, very powerful names in, in, in physics, astrophysics, and so on, and uh, theoretical physics. And uh, he was a mathematician. Everyone respected his abilities, but they didn't respect this theory. And the reason why they didn't respect the theory, they had this knee-jerk reaction against his theory because they they immediately took it as a, a a kind of Trojan horse in the scientific world, as an effort to introduce the the idea of creation. Mm -hmm. That's how they understood it. What what Monsieur Lemaitre was saying was that creation that the universe had a beginning. It had a beginning. An instantaneous beginning it came into being, uh, burst into being in a sense, uh, and um, and they all associated that that's creation. We can't allow that, and so there was a very very visceral reaction on the anti-God uh, scientific part to condemn that, absolutely dismiss it. They were not, wanted nothing to do with it, but of course. I mean, even Einstein, I believe, even Einstein, uh, you know, he, he tried to come up with the idea of a steady state universe, and he even saw the mathematics didn't work, so he plugged in a, what he called the, the cosmological constant to try to make up for the deficiencies because this doesn't work, really. Mm -hmm. Well, eventually, even he had to admit that Monsieur Lemaitre was right. But um, Pope Pius XII actually wanted the uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences to uh, feature a, a um, conference with Monsieur Lemaitre on this theory you know, that he was proposing here. It was his enemies, the enemies of the theory, who ridiculed it as the Big Bang, you know. And that's what stuck, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as the name of it. But it was a ridicule of theory. So when people talk about the Big Bang as though it's absolutely true now, they're using the terminology of ridicule against it, and at the same time they're promoting it. Yeah. But um, when Papias the Twelfth wanted to have Monsieur Lemaitre present this paper at the Vatican Academy of Sciences, like it was a good Congress, worldwide Congress going on. Monsieur Lemaitre said, "Holy Father, please don't, do not uh, require this, <coughs> because if you do, then this will spell the end of this whole idea, the end of the whole theory, because everyone in this, well, not everyone, different, but the vast majority of the scientists." will reject it as a matter of creationism, and they will not even regard it as science, just because we approve, you know, just because the church approves of it, <coughs> or seems to approve of it. <coughs> but uh, whereas now, I mean, the, the, the scientists have tried to co-opt the idea because they can't escape it. You know, they can't escape the logic of it, mm -hmm. <coughs> can't escape the mathematics of it. They're trying to pervert it and twist it. <coughs> but originally, it, it was considered to be a, uh, a declaration that the universe had a beginning and was created. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Pope Pius XII, you know, you talk about things he did, you talk about his, <clears throat> you know, humani generis with evolution, you talk about um, the Big Bang Theory uh, with Monsieur Lemaitre. I mean, he was very much... Uh, uh, Pope during a, a very tumultuous time in the church, sure. and so uh, I'm not I'm not prepared to condemn him. Uh, although I see many evil things that came came about during his reign, um, I I actually think that that these were the machinations and manipulations of modernists who had gotten into power and took advantage of his disability. Mm 
Okay. Well, Father, I'd be interested to hear what you think of another pope, a much earlier pope, from one of our, our viewers, writes in and asks, Father, why was Pope Honorius I not declared to be an anti-pope? Was it because he did not teach heresy ex cathedra? Uh, Father Matteo, Father Matteo, apostle of the enthronement of the Sacred Heart, considered the Pope to be as a second Eucharist. For this, he was praised by the Holy Father and encouraged to spread this devotion alongside devotion to the Holy Eucharist. Do you think traditional Catholics have lost a true appreciation for the gift of the papacy? Well, I'd say definitely, yes. Okay. I think traditional Catholics have. I think they've been affected by the modernists uh, who have taken uh, the position, of, I mean, in the eyes of the world anyway. Um, I think the modernists have witnessed such men as John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth, right on through. All of them disgraced the papacy because of what they've done, because of what they failed to do. Both. Okay. <clears throat> there are those who consider uh, Cardinal Ratzinger become Benedict XVI, the great conservative, and he's only conservative when you, he only appears conservative when you put him between. You know, John the, Paul II and, and Francis. I mean, you know, it's all relative with them, but that's how modernism is. Everything is relative anyway with modernism. Sure. There's no absolute truth. You know. So, um, <clears throat> those who, who would want to say, oh, we've got to go back to the days of Benedict XVI, <clears throat> you, you have the new Mass, you have the, the new Catechism, you have the, all this new stuff, you know. <clears throat> all, all the modernist construct of the new church has come out of it and was in place in, in, in Benedict's time. He was just wanting to put some window dressing of, of um, the, the traditional faith on it. Uh, and um, even his Samorum Pontificum that he allowed, you know, a greater latitude in using the 1962 liturgy. <clears throat> I mean, that, that was basically an attempt to really legitimize the Novus Ordo and say, look, these, these two are, legit, are, are compatible. I mean, he didn't sort it this way, but modernism and Catholicism, sure. They can exist together. They can coexist in the same church, right? Well, we could even consider them the same religion, can't we? And the answer is no, we can't, okay? And the modernists, um, you know, made that point when they said, well, you have the ordinary liturgy, which is the, the Novus Ordo, you know, and you have the extraordinary liturgy, which we're now allowing, and that's the, the Latin Mass, as they like to just generically call it. Um... But the fact, even the fact they're saying this is ordinary and this is extraordinary, this is the exception, <clears throat> it means that this is just being tolerated, mm -hmm. you know? And then you tolerate an evil, and that's how they look at it. They tried to make it disappear for 20 years. Yeah, exactly. But after the new mass came out, they wouldn't allow the traditional mass at all, you know? Mm -hmm. Then they had to allow it after it was clear it wasn't going to go away. But they had to control it. But they're, what they're doing is merely tolerating it. Because if they could, they'd make it disappear entirely, just as they originally intended. So people who are, again, going to the Novus Ordo for the sake of practicing a tr the traditional Catholic faith, and think that they can pr practice the traditional Catholic faith within the Novus Ordo, are delusional. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, to get, to get back to the question uh, of the effect of the papacy, or the very concept of the papacy, even in the minds of traditional Catholics. Of course, the antics of these modernists in the Vatican have done enormous damage, not only in deceiving the people who are following them, but even, even in attacking the very idea, the sanctity of the, of the, the office of the papacy as the vicar of Christ on earth, and, uh, and the authority of the papacy, of course. The prestige, all of that has suffered from these men. Um, you see, we have a generation that has grown up entirely under the modern, modernists as popes. And we talk to them about the, the greatness and the grandeur and the glory of past popes, who are truly saints and hero, true heroes in every word, of God and man. You know? and, uh, but this is... Former times. This is old. This is long, long ago, far, far away, as far as these young people are concerned. All they know is what's going on in the world now, when they're growing up, and this is what they see. They see a Francis, you know? And, of course, the papacy is going to suffer in their minds, in their hearts. What allegiance will they have to that? You know, what respect would they even have for it? <clears throat> we see what respect Francis has for the, the office, you know? 
of the true papacy. He, he rejects the true papacy. He's following some modernist construct of so-called papacy that they, <clears throat> that they imagine, but it sure didn't come from Christ, that's for sure. <clears throat> so, um, but as, as far as Pope Honorius I goes, um, Honorius I uh, lived out his papacy in honor, died, and considered to be a pope. Some thought a very good pope when he died. Okay, it was only after his death that uh, there was a, a strong reaction, shall we say? Um, um, the emperor in the, the early six hundreds, mid six hundreds, backed up his command that Catholics not speak about a heresy, a heresy mono. Pisitism, monotheltism that was going on at the time uh, because it was divisive. Because Catholics needed to speak about it to condemn it and say it's not the Catholic faith. So they needed to defend the faith by talking about this heresy and saying it's wrong. And uh, Honorius I forbade everyone to talk about it. Exactly the opposite of what needed to be done, exactly the opposite of what he needed to do. He needed to answer the question. Uh, is this heretical or is it not? Is it permiss permissible to um, prevaricate, produce uh, creed, uh, creeds, I'm sorry, creeds uh, of faith that are obs so obscure they, <clears throat> they will allow this misinterpretation, a heretical misinterpretation of what the faith really is? I mean, this is very serious business. You know, it's like the whole faith could be get adulterated. And it really had to do with who our Lord was. It came down to really who Jesus Christ really is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hanging in the balance here was the, the very identity of our Lord, what we believe of him. So, anyway, um, the emperor backed up uh, Honorius' decree. Uh, the emperor just thought it was very divisive to argue about these things, so he said, everybody be quiet. Nobody talks about this. Well, of course, the heretics continued talking about it. Mm -hmm. The Catholics were silenced by the Pope, right? They couldn't defend the faith, <clears throat> but they realized that this was wrong. And there were some great Catholic uh, churchmen who stood up, blatantly defying the direct command of Honorius I, and speaking boldly in favor of the faith and condemning the, the heresy. And the Church's judgment on this is very clear. Subsequently, Honorius was condemned. He was pronounced excommunicated 40 years after he died. He was even, um, he was even listed with heretics, as one of the heretics. And he might have subscribed to monothelitism. Or, um, he might have subscribed to the, to, the, to the heresy himself. There are indications he was sympathetic to it anyway. Okay. But uh, even if he didn't, okay, he one thing for sure he, he, he did not do is defend the faith against it. And so he failed horribly in his responsibility. And uh, so he was roundly condemned by subsequent pontiffs and by councils that came after him, condemned absolutely for his failure. But as this writer says, um, he was never denounced as an anti-pope. He was never declared an anti-pope. That would be much more problematic to take a pope that was universally recognized as the pope during his lifetime, who was elevated to the papacy, accepted by all Catholics as the pope, who then died in honor as truly one of the popes. And um, his decrees honored, accepted, and so on, the good ones. You know, he did other things too, you know. Um, and then to turn around... 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, and say he was really an anti-pope anti all that time. How could the church do that? Um, uh, actually, theologically, she could not do that. She'd have to say he was a very bad pope. But um, to me, the fact is, Honorius was truly a pope. He was the Bishop of Rome, he was the vicar of Christ on earth. He was the successor of St. Peter. He really held the office of the papacy. Mm -hmm. uh, the Pope can't basically um, 
degrade him, fire him, demote him. The church, I should say, can't, can't post-mortem demote him from that office mm -hmm. if he held it truly in life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that he failed in his responsibility, again, would not mean that he had lost the papacy because he failed in his responsibility. Now, if he had come out publicly and defined a, a, a heresy as the faith, right, um, that might be a very different matter, right? Mm -hmm. There have to be proceedings, and then the church would have dealt with issues that we're facing now much longer ago. You know? mm -hmm. But he's right. Uh, Honorius was not declared an anti pope because, frankly, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. He really was the pope at that time, and that was the horror of it all that he was failing so miserably in the responsibility of being Pope while he was the Pope. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, Father, I'd like to stop there, um, but I would just like to point out, without getting too much into this, because I feel like it could be a, another topic for, a, for an entirely different yeah. show, but I think this, um, I, I believe you've mentioned this in the past, that this example of Pope Honorius, that, that gives us a really good example of the way that traditional Catholics should act when faced with the problems surrounding mm. the papacy today. I mean, here you have a man who the entire Catholic world uh, viewed as the true, legitimate Roman mm. pontiff, um, vicar of Christ on mm. earth, and yet those who, um, who, who, who opposed him, those who, who fought his commands, they were canonized saints by the church. So mm. even if the modern popes, even if, and, and all of their um, and, and all of their failures, even if they are they were legitimate Roman mm. pontiffs and vicars of Christ on earth, mm. true Catholic obedience doesn't mean that you have to blindly follow the pope. It means, as Saint Robert Bellarmine said, you have to oppose them. Exactly. But that is if there is no question, mm -hmm. even about their papacy. And during the time of Honorius, there was no question about right. the fact that he was the pope. Right. And. Um, and even later, you know, it was that question that he, had, in fact, had indeed been the Pope. Exactly. That's not the case with these men today, yeah. because their errors are so egregious, uh, errors against faith are so egregious, mm -hmm. that one has <coughs> truly legitimate questions, and there are a lot of questions being raised about them. Right. You know, even whether they can be Popes mm -hmm. in the first place, because they don't even believe in the papacy. Right. Uh, exhibit A, Francis. <laughs> exactly. Well... There's a lot more that could be said on that, certainly. Mm, but, there certainly is. Yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll stop there for today, okay, Father. So Sounds good. thank you for being here, and happy St. Patrick's Day well, to you. Well, St. Patrick's Day to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe, and also thank you for sending in your emails. We are working on getting to all of the email questions that we have received. Of course, there are still multiple outstanding topics and, and questions that still need to be addressed, and we do plan on doing that in a timely manner. But again, thank you all for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.